next Sunday is Night of Worship at the park. And so if you're as excited as Pastor Chris is excited, you should be, because it's going to be, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, it's going to be awesome, so be there, or be there, because it's going to be a great time. And online, you can join us for that as well. So it's next Sunday at 6 p.m., either in person or online, you can join us too. So we're super looking forward to that. So good morning, everybody. My name is, um, well, my name is Rachel. I'm the pastor of spiritual community here at New Life, and if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, hi. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting to meet you and connect. A few fast facts about me are that I'm a Taylor grad. Um, woo! <laughs> yeah, some people are excited about that. Um, I love IWU as well because I've gotten to live here in this community and get to know um, IWU students who attend New Life. So love the connections we get to make with both Taylor and IWU. I love the outdoors and the mountains, and I love Albanese gummies. If you know, you know, those things are amazing. Um, so some things, some people do know this and some people don't know this, but when I was a kid, I would come home from school, I would get off the bus, I would go home, and I would watch HGTV shows with my mom. And so you're like, what 11-year-old wants to watch HGTV? This, this one, this 11-year-old wanted to watch HGTV. And so we would watch these shows, and sometimes we'd still watch them. When I'm at my parents' house, we loved, like, Fixer Upper when that was on HGTV. Now we mostly watch um, House Hunters. And so given my history with HGTV, it's really no wonder that when I went to college for the first time, I was super pumped about decorating my dorm room. Does anybody else get pumped about decorating their dorm room? Yes. Just over here <laughs> gets pumped about decorating their dorm room. Yes, so I love decorating my dorm room. Maybe you can relate to that. And when I moved here to Mary and I had the same feeling about my house, I was so excited to decorate my house. And I had like all the Pinterest boards of all the things that I was gonna do. And I still do, because I still love like making little changes to my space here and there, because that's just something I really like thinking about. Um, Making things new and transforming things to make them look different is something, is a process I really enjoy. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you love HGTV, designing your dorm room. Maybe you like designing your house. Maybe you like redoing cars. Um, maybe you've done a whole redesign or remodel on your house or even just like a room or an item in your house. And honestly, even sometimes cleaning your house feels like a transformation. I had that this week. <laughs> I did some cleaning and I was like, wow, this looks amazing. It went from looks like my closet threw up to please put this on the cover of Better Homes and Gardens. Like, <laughs> it sometimes can be like that process isn't always easy. Sometimes it gets messy. Sometimes it has to get worse before it actually looks better. And maybe you don't love that process, and maybe you do, regardless of if you like it or not, regardless of if you've been through it recently or not, you know what I just said. It's not always quick. It can be messy. And it doesn't always tend to go very well if there, it doesn't have any vision or direction. It doesn't tend to go very well if you don't know what your space or what you're making is becoming. Back to HGTV, I remember one time we were watching, it was like this design challenge show, and people, they just had to grab a bunch of random stuff and then like make something out of it. And some people, they grabbed this really funky, cool, unique, awesome stuff, but then they kind of struggled in the competition because they got all this stuff together, but they hadn't stopped to ask, what is this becoming? They had all this cool stuff, but they didn't have any direction for what is this gonna become? What are we actually gonna do with this? And what is this becoming is similar to the question that we are asking today, and that is, who am I becoming? Today we're jumping into our Becoming Sermon series, and this week Life Groups will be jumping into the Becoming Life Group study. So I want to take this opportunity to say this is a journey that you really don't want to miss. Get in a life group, grab a friend to go through the study with. It's not about how many people, it's about you and who. So find your people, hop on this journey, because I promise you that you want to be all in on this. So as we are walking through the series on Sunday mornings and in life groups, we'll be walking through the book of Galatians as we talk about becoming and life transformation. 
So Galatians was written by a guy named Paul. Paul is a pretty well-known guy. Raise your hand if you know who Paul is. Online, you can do the little like hand emoji. That's like, I use it all the time when I online host. Just raise your hand. (laughs) But so Paul was an apostle. He wasn't one of the original 12, but he was an apostle who planted churches and then wrote letters to help encourage those churches. And eventually those letters were recognized as scripture and make up a large part of the New Testament. So Paul was and is this prolific guy, but he wasn't always that person. And his story is at the heart of what we are talking about here today. So let me tell you a little bit about Paul. Paul actually used to be named Saul. He was Jewish and he was a Pharisee, which meant that he was a religious leader. He was incredibly devout and pious and Paul was hardcore. But Paul admits in Galatians 1, that he really wasn't hardcore about God necessarily, but he was hardcore about religion. And Galatians 1.14 says this, I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. Heritage is important, and it's okay to be proud of who you are and where you come from, but our heritage isn't worthy of our worship. The systems and institutions of religion are not worthy of our worship and they can't save us. The church is Christ's bride and the word of God is meant to be taken seriously and the guidelines meant to be obeyed, but the church can't save you. Scripture, the law can't save you, only Jesus can. And the church and scripture are essential to walking with Jesus and living a Christian life, but they alone, they don't have saving power. In this part of the letter, Paul is doing a little bit of explaining about what his life used to be like and what it's like now. And so he tells us what we just read about being zealous for Judaism, and he also tells them about how he used to persecute and murder Christians. Let that sink into your brain for a second. Paul was kind of like a religious extremist. He did evil and criminal things that if we saw them on the news today, we would be appalled at. So he shares that with them and then is like, but now I preach the gospel and all the people knew about me was my past. And so when I showed up, they were like, wait, this dude who used to persecute Christians and now he does this. Okay. In Acts 9, it's explained this way. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus. Yes, and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So Paul has a transformation so dramatic that people don't really understand it or believe it right away. It creates confusion really both ways you look at it because one way to frame it is to look at Paul's past and say, this guy was a murderer and now he's a pastor. What what do we make of that? How did that happen? And the other way is to say, this guy is a pastor. How did he used to be a murderer? That doesn't make sense. I don't believe that's his story. But here's a news flash. God is in the business of writing unbelievable stories. Yeah! God is in the business of writing unbelievable stories. The Israelites came across the Red Sea on dry land Gideon defeated a big army with a tiny one. David slayed Goliath. The walls of Jericho fell down after people marched around them playing trumpets. Water was turned into wine. Lepers were healed. Blind men could see. Lazarus came back to life. Jesus was crucified and walked out of the grave. And if God can write those kinds of stories, just imagine story that he's writing for you right now. If God can take dead things and make them alive, he can do the same for you too. 
Friends, the gospel isn't at its core about behavior modification. It's about life transformation. You'll see it up there, life transformation over behavior modification. See, the truth is, it's about the fact that humans are born spiritually dead. Isn't that weird? Like, you look physically alive, but you're spiritually dead. It's like a flower after you pick it, right? It looks alive, but essentially, it's dead. You put it in a vase for water, that's basically like life support. I've just ruined flowers, for <laughs> picking flowers for everybody in this room, but it's fine. And Jesus says, you came into this world spiritually dead, but I love you. I died for you. I died to save you from this sinful nature that you were born with. I died to save you from every sin you ever committed, from every sin that you will commit. I have justified you. I have made you right with God. And because of that, if you repent and say yes to me, you can have life. And in that moment, the moment that you come face to face with the reality of your deadness and say, Jesus, I confess my sins and I am sorry. Beyond my words or explanation, I am sorry. Please be my savior. In that moment, you go from being dead in your sin to being alive in Christ. And that sounds like an unbelievable story, but it's true. Christ's love transforms us from being dead to being alive. Just like Paul had used to and is now, so do we. And when we say to Jesus, when we say yes to him, when we know him as our personal Lord and Savior, the first thing on our list of used to's and is now's is I used to be dead in my sin, but now I'm alive in Christ. I used to be dead, but now I'm alive. And that is beyond amazing. But it doesn't stop there. When we have Jesus in our lives, we get to spend the rest of our lives going on this becoming journey with him. For all my theology vocab people out there, once we get justified, we get to be sanctified. And that is what becoming is all about. When Paul met Jesus, he went from death to life, and that's when he saw himself start to go from a murderer to a pastor, from a religious person to a Jesus follower. I'm going to pause for a second because you might be thinking, Rachel, you said that the gospel isn't about behavior modification, and now you are saying when Paul met Jesus, it helped him modify his behavior. Help me with that. When I say that the gospel isn't about behavior modification, what I mean is that the gospel is not about playing the part of a good Christian. For part of my life, what I chased was wanting to be good. What I wanted was to be good. And being good is fine, but you can be good and not love Jesus. You can follow all of the rules and be perfect, but not love Jesus. There are plenty of decent people in the world who don't love Jesus. The gospel is not about being good or doing all the church things and saying all the right words and having all the right Christian behaviors, but none of the Christian heart posture. What happened to Paul is that he was transformed by the renewing of his mind. Romans 12, 2 says this, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. The word transform that you see here is actually the Greek word metamorphose. And it looks a lot like metamorphosis, and it means to become a new thing, to take a new shape. Imagine for a second that your mind is like a hunk of clay and it's been shaped by all of these things, all of these influences telling you, you don't have enough money. So you need to keep it all to yourself so you can get ahead. You have this hole in you. Another person, that's what's gonna fill it. You're not happy. So let's just inject some of this stuff 
into your bloodstream to take the edge off for a second. And it'll be fine. That person, that person is different than you. And that frustration that you're feeling with them, it's okay. It's justified. It's okay if it turns into something ugly. It's okay if you slam them in the Facebook comments. It's all fine. You can give when you get ahead. You can always break it off. You can always turn it off. You can always stop. It's justified. And you have your clay brain that's been shaped by all of that. But you give it to the Lord and you say, make me something new. Please be my potter. I am done with all the other potters. I am done trying to be the potter. You be my potter. You are the potter. Make me something new. And suddenly he starts shaping your mind to see things differently. And you become influenced by the voice of truth. And your mind changes shape. And it flows down to your heart and out your hands and out your feet. So you actually live differently than you did before. Paul didn't just start saying the right things and doing the right things and being good. Paul didn't just change outfits. He changed shape. He transformed. And it was a process. It was a process that took Time. Paul writes his letter to the Galatians 15 years after his conversion. He went from death to life instantly, but some of his used tos to is nows took time. When a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, it goes into a chrysalis for four weeks and then it comes out a butterfly. An oak tree starts out as a little sapling and starts to look like a mature oak tree after 30 to 40 years. It takes time. Remodeling your house takes time. Reorganizing a room in your house takes time. My parents live in Indy. I like going to visit them. The construction on 31 takes time. Feels like it's been an eternity, y'all. We live in a world that is obsessed with instant gratification. We live in a world that's always telling us to put things in the microwave. And don't get me wrong, I love microwave cooking hacks as much as the next gal, possibly more. But there's no shortcut in this process. This is crock pot cooking right here. It takes time. It takes patience. But it is worth it. The results are worth the process. I personally do not think that I've ever had anything from a microwave that tasted better than something that was made in a crock pot. Can anybody else say the same thing? Yes. It takes time, but it's worth the process. The journey is really lifelong, and we never really arrive on this side of eternity. We talked about this last week about the mission statement, making, having a modification instead of saying helping people become committed and powered followers of Jesus to just saying becoming committed and powered followers of Jesus. Because saying the helping inadvertently applies that we've arrived and that's just simply not true. We are all in a journey of becoming together. We are all in different places on that journey, but we are all on a journey. And I believe that we are called to walk alongside one another and invest in one another on that journey and help in that way. Shout out to life groups, get in a life group, don't do life alone. <laughs> but Jesus is the one who has truly arrived and is the one that can help us from that place. In order to receive that help, though, we have to actively engage in the process. Well, being justified requires our faith. Being sanctified requires some work. Becoming something new requires an active effort from us. We can't become who we want to become, who God wants us to become by simply just doing nothing. It's like taking care of your health, right? It doesn't just magically happen. If it did, that would be amazing. But if you want to live a healthy lifestyle, a lifestyle that helps your body feel its best and function properly, it takes some effort on your part. Like you could have a dietitian and a personal trainer and all these people and stuff, but if you don't go to the gym or the appointments, it really doesn't do anything. We have to play an active role in our becoming. 
Somebody who I really admire in my life and who really inspires me is my dad. And I recently watched my dad take his health really seriously. He wanted transformation in that area of his life, and it wasn't just something that he could sit idly by for. It required stopping something old and starting something new. He is an avid walker. He is smart about what he eats. We were on vacation like a month ago, and we were at this place, and we were eating dessert. I wasn't being a super good influence. And they had this um, dessert. I think it was like a blackberry something or other. That's like his favorite thing. But it was like this pie cobbler something that I knew that he really, really liked. And I was like, Dad, you should just have this one. Like, we're on vacation. You love this. It's just one. You should just have it. And he was like, no, it's a gateway. I'm not going back. Put another way, the becoming process is an intentional one. It's like if you have ever been in a lazy river or in a pool just floating in an inner tube, when you're just in one of those things floating, you don't really have control over where you're going. You're just floating, you're just drifting, and you're just letting the current take you where it will. It reminded me of something that I heard somebody say a few years ago, and that's that we don't usually just drift toward where we want to be. We don't really get where we want to go by being directionless. Actually, just floating and drifting usually takes us away from where we want to go. We have to be intentional and steer ourselves toward what we want to become, toward who God wants us to become. We have to take an active role in our becoming process and partner with the Spirit as he works in us and on us and say, you make me new, but I'm going to get rid of the old, not as good stuff, and I'm going to commit to doing a new thing, and I am not going back. Just like my dad, I got to believe that Paul was somebody who was not going back. I got to believe he saw the used tos and is nows in his own life, and he knew that he was under construction. But seeing how God had made him new, he didn't want to go back to the old. And part of Paul's purpose in writing the Galatians is that they were trying to go back to the old. See, Paul had been at the church in Galatia, and then he left. And in that time that he was gone, these people came in and were communicating a false gospel. And it was trying to make the Galatians go back to living under certain Jewish practices and living under the law. These people were teaching that they were gatekeepers to belief and salvation, and the Galatians were buying into it. And Paul, he writes them frustrated and convicted and appalled because they knew that there isn't anything that you can do to be justified or earn your salvation. They knew that that's something that God does for us. The only way is through faith. There is no more needing to live under the law because of Christ. There is getting to live under grace and walking in freedom. And I got to believe that Paul was saying, why would you ever want to go back? Why would you ever want to go back to the old way when you know, when you've experienced the new and the better way? Why would you want to go back? As we become, there can be the temptation to go back. And Paul's right. It's not very logical, but it happens. You go back because it's known, because it's easy, because you let your guard down for a second. The Galatians started to go back because they were influenced by other people. And the same is true for us. Sometimes we go back because we're influenced by other people who are still there. We go back because we experience a setback. We saw this just a few weeks ago with the Israelites. They experienced setbacks. And when that happened, they started complaining and wanted to go back to Egypt. And Moses was like, why? Sometimes when we experience a setback, we get discouraged and we start to think, why did I think I could ever be different? Why did I think I could ever be more than this? I am an addict. I am a liar. I am a criminal. I am a worrier. I am a cheater. I am a failure. I am fill in whatever your blank is there. Can I tell you this? The past cannot answer the question of who you are. You are a son. 
You are a daughter. You are beloved. You are called. You are chosen. And just because the process gets messy doesn't mean that the process won't be completed or come to fruition or that God is going to give up on you. Paul points out in Galatians 1 that before he was born, even in his days of being bent against the gospel, God saw him and was calling him and had a plan for him. No matter where you are in your process, I want you to be encouraged by this truth is that God loves you and he has a good plan for your life that he is going to see through. He has created you anew for a purpose his creating you anew will result in good works. We know that from Ephesians 2, 10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You may experience setbacks in your journey to becoming, but that doesn't mean that the process is over. You are not your past, the things you did, the person that you were. Stay the course. He has called you. He loves you, and it will be worth it. Like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, if the butterfly went back, she would forfeit so much. Do not forfeit what you are becoming. Do not forfeit what God has for you. Don't forfeit your identity as his child for something lesser, for something that isn't even your true identity. Don't give it up. It's not worth giving up the truth for a lie, no matter how true the lie may seem. I believe that God is transforming his people into people that more closely resemble his son. I believe that when you hear the question, who are you becoming, one of the first things that pops into your mind should be more like Jesus. But I also believe that God has something unique for each of us. And that's why our becoming processes can look a little different. Because, yeah, I'm becoming more like Jesus. At least that's the hope. But I'm also becoming more like Rachel, the person that God created Rachel to be. We have all been marred by sin in general ways, but we have also been marred by sin in specific ways. We all have a sin fingerprint, and God is in the process of redeeming that for all of us right now. And like we just talked about, God is in the process of helping you become the person who is going to carry out the good works he planned in advance for you to do. And they aren't all the same. This, what I'm doing right now, getting, having the opportunity to preach to you this morning, this is something that I believe that I was called and created to do. This is part of what God has laid out for me. I believe that. And if preaching is part of what God is calling you to do too, then chase that. But if it's not, don't. I think sometimes we get in this headspace that the epitome of Christian life or discipleship or the best thing that you can do in following Jesus is vocational ministry. And that's just not true. The kingdom doesn't exist the way it's supposed to if we all do the same thing. The kingdom doesn't exist the way it's supposed to if we are all preachers. The kingdom needs people who are terrified of standing in front of people and talking, but who love operating a camera or running the sound system or doing something where they don't necessarily have to be seen by anybody else. The kingdom needs artists and entrepreneurs and scientists. The kingdom needs people who love math and who love calculus. The kingdom needs engineers. The kingdom needs creatives and managers. The kingdom needs you to become who God made you to be, not who God made me to be. The kingdom needs you to become who God is calling you to become, who God is helping you become. The person God wants you to become is the best person that you can be, even if there's a sneaking voice in your head that says, that other person is better. <laughs> Knowing that, know that becoming the person that God created and called you to be, it's the best person that you can be, period. Comparison is a thief of purpose. Become who you were called to be. I want to wrap up our time together here today by coming back to that simple question. 
Who are you becoming? It's a simple question, but it's not always an easy one. Who are you becoming? I want to take a moment. I want you to take a moment and reflect on this question. When you came in, there was a little piece of paper on your chair. And so as you're reflecting, I want you to write down one word that you think describes who you are becoming. For some of you, that word is going to feel really positive. You're going to feel great about it. For some of you, you're like, I don't really like it, but if I'm honest, this is what I'm becoming. So I want, yeah, take a moment, write down that word. I'm going to think of what my word is right now. And after you write that word down, take a look at it. And if you like it, if you like who you're becoming, if you are becoming more the person that God has called you and created you to be, keep that card. Take it home with you. Put it somewhere where you're going to see it often to remind you that this is what I'm moving toward. This is the person that God has called me and created me to be, and I am not going back. And if you don't like who you're becoming, if you're looking at that card and you're like, Ugh, I've drifted into this person and I don't like it, look at it and just rip it. If you don't like who you're becoming, it's not too late. If you don't like the word that you wrote down, rip it up. And let today be the day where you say, God, this is honestly where I'm at. Help me become what you want me to be. Shape me into the person that you know I can be. Help me get back on track. Help me surrender to you in this process. And maybe you need to surrender for the first time. Maybe Jesus isn't the Lord of your life yet, and that's a step that you want to take today. So I'm going to take us into a time of prayer now. I'm going to have everybody close your eyes. And if you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time today, just raise your hand. Online, you can do the same thing that you did before. Just raise your little emoji hand in the comments there. And our online host, Sylvana, is there for you. And if that's you today, pray these words with me. Dear Jesus, make me something new. I confess that I'm a sinner and I need a savior and I'm sorry beyond my words for my sin. And today I ask you to forgive me and be the Lord of my life. I love you and I just ask you to make me new. And God, for all of us in this room, I thank you that you do make us new. Thank you for having a plan for each of us and how you were with us in each step of our becoming journey. God, we're all broken and we need to become something new. Thank you for not just abandoning us. Thank you for seeing something in us, for loving us, for going on this journey with us, for helping us, for giving us direction, just for loving us, God. Lord, we love you and we're ready to go on this becoming transformation journey. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So I'll leave you with the challenge and the questions here up on the screen. So the challenge this week is to reflect on your own becoming journey using the questions that will appear in just a second and encourage somebody else in theirs. Think of somebody who asked the Spirit, who do you want me to encourage this week? And send them a text, send them a note in the mail. Do something to actually encourage somebody else in their journey this week. So here are the questions that we can use to reflect on our becoming journey. Or What are some of your used tos and is nows? How have you seen transformation in your life in the past? How are you seeing God transform you right now? And who has God created and called you to be? Take time to reflect on this question with him this week. I'm so glad you are here with us this morning, whether you're joining us here in person or online. So excited to jump into our Becoming series and our Becoming Life Group study this week. We love you guys so much. Have a great week, and we will see you really soon.